This is Dalton House, the Treasury Building in Sydney, and it's a minute to four on Budget Day. And in a moment, I'm going to go through that door, and it's going to shut on me and all the financial writers that you see walking in behind me, whose stories will be appearing in the press tomorrow morning. Four Corners hit him like a sledgehammer. Here was a program that uh, didn't start with dancing girls and tinsel and stars. And all that. It started with people talking, and it was serious. So here we go for the next four hours. Locked in. It was not like a lecture in college or a class at school. It was reality. At this arch, Macau, Portugal, Europe ends and the vastness of Mao Zedong's China begins. And so on tiptoe, accompanied by Portuguese officers, I was permitted a hurried peep through this pillbox. Expecting any moment to hear the crash of musketry, I took my first look at China, expecting to see bristling defences and the armed might of the People's Republic, what we saw was this, a row of lettuces in no man's land, and a bloke in a Woolworths plastic Mac who refused to come out of his shelter. Michael Talton was a very <laughs> likeable, personable, interesting character. He, he was wonderful at talking to people. And wherever we went, we went all over the world, all over Australia. Uh, we could go down to the docks and talk to the wharfies. And they would all call Mike mate. Everybody liked him because he had a very good personality. And he had the, the sort of uh, the common touch, you might say, as far as it, as it goes. And uh, he worked very hard and took it very seriously. He looked good, he sounded good. He had a very fine mind, and working with Bob Raymond, who was another fine mind, the two of them were a very pretty powerful uh, combination. It's high noon in Marble Bar, the hottest town in Australia. A thousand miles from Perth, this could pass for Australia's Wild West. I believe you call the pub here the bank. Why do you call it that? Well, uh, that's where all the... <laughs> the boys put their money. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was completely new. In those days, most Australians lived in cities and the, the urban dwellers of Australia didn't really know much about what was going on outside the cities. That was somewhere way out back and beyond. So that when we started going out into the, into the rest of Australia, they found it fascinating to see what... Birdsville was like, what Cooper Pedy was like, what Marble Bar was like, what the Northern Territory was like. Just over here is a cemetery, a cemetery for the dead, and what Bishop Davies has called a cemetery for the living is all around us. In the third week, I saw a little item in, in the Sydney Morning Herald where the Bishop of Newcastle had described an Aboriginal settlement at Box Ridge near Casino as a living cemetery. I said to Mike, maybe we should go and and see what this, you know, what he's talking about. Went out the Box Ridge and discovered this extraordinarily depressing. You know, it came as a terrible shock to us uh, because in 1961, let's face it, news crews from television stations didn't go anywhere near Aboriginal settlements. I mean, there wasn't any story there. We're going to talk now with some of the people who live here at Box Ridge. Nobody had really any idea of what degradation people were living in. And when we saw how people were living in this settlement with dreadful housing, uh, no water, no permanent water laid on, uh, no sewerage collection, no rubbish collection, we were appalled. And the people told us, you know, in a very quiet, dignified way of what a terrible time they were having and, you know, what the shortcomings were. My grandkid is born in Australia, he's a citizen of Australia. You see? Of course he is, because he's a native-born Australian, see? But how brilliant the people, me, I'm not. Somewhere wrong here. It caused um, quite a stir. I mean, if we were shocked when we saw what was happening there, so were the viewers. I mean, people all over Australia were outraged, and the New South Wales government was deluged on Monday with all kinds of uh, protests and outrage. And, uh, you know, the, the, the effect on the Australian population was quite significant, I think. When Charlton and Raymond left and uh, Robert Moore, Frank Bennett and myself were appointed as a sort of uh, uh, hydra-headed monster to take over, um, it, was, it was very tough. 
the pressures to get the program up each week were intense, and very often uh, you'd research something on Monday, fly interstate and shoot it on Tuesday and Wednesday, come back and edit it uh, on Thursday and Friday, and hopefully get a 20 to 30 minute report up uh, for that weekend's program. Now, it's easy to do that, but with the kind of research that you need for some of the topics we were covering, it was really pretty tough. And in those days, I mean, it's weird when you look back on it now, there was no STD dialing in those days, and any phone call we made had to go to the telephone operator at the switchboard, they'd make the trunk call, and then they'd switch it through to us. I mean, when I look back on it now, it's just crazy that we ever managed to, to get the program together each week. This is the badge of one of the most exclusive ex-soldiers organisations in the world. Its membership stands at a quarter of a million, restricted to veterans who served in operational theatres of war. In recent years, it has become a powerful and controversial force in Australian politics, regarded by its admirers as the citadel of Australian nationalism, labelled by its critics as reactionary and militaristic. There is little doubt that governments listen when the RSL speaks. When I was growing up in the 1930s, this particular RSL branch here at Caulfield in Melbourne was known to my family simply as the club. The RSL saw itself, I think, as being unchallengeable, and Ashbolt challenged it, not in a bold or uh, derisory way, but simply asked it to justify itself. In particular, he asked it to justify its undoubted political influence. Wouldn't you regard the RSL's pronouncements on defence, immigration and communism as essentially political? They're all political matters, but they're not party political as far as the League is concerned. We look on those as national matters. Sir Robert Menzies asked for some tr previous week's transcripts of the program to try to find out what on earth this dangerous program was doing. Mr. Semler, he said, I know about you and your four corners. And he, he said, I know that that program is designed for one reason and one reason only, to discredit my government and my cabinet. And he turned his back on me. Half a century's traffic has flowed past Brisbane's Regatta Hotel since the suffragettes rattled their chains in England. But today at the Regatta Hotel, women are still fighting for equality. The right to drink with men in public bars in Queensland in 1965. It wasn't a very expensive protest. The dog chain cost only five and six, and the padlocks were only two bob each. But whatever the cost the women felt, it was the principle of the thing that mattered. If the publican served them with liquor, he faced a fine of ten to twenty pounds. And so did anyone else in the bar who bought them a beer or even shouted them a brandy, lime and soda. In the dreams of a few, the unremarkable pavements of Charlotte Street ring with the sound of a thousand jackboots stepping out to the most infamous march in the history of the world. And to enter the headquarters of the National Socialist Party of Australia is to enter a world one had thought was dead. Here there are skeletons in the cupboard, and they're ominous ones. This is not a Munich beer hall 40 years ago, it is Ashfield today. These men hold the ranks and command a structure modelled on Hitler's party. Hail Hitler! Mr Arthur C. Smith, the leader of the Australian National Socialist Party. Good evening, friends, comrades. Young people of Australia, we need you. Young people of Australia, we want you. Some drug users call it the good religion. This group in Sydney calls it getting turned on, smoking marijuana cigarettes. The most popular name for it is pot. Depending on how it's rolled, an ounce of pot can make a hundred cigarettes or only a couple of dozen. These pot smokers came together to get turned on last Wednesday night in an old house in the inner Sydney suburb of Glebe. Their ages range from 18 to 28. Some are artists, the others include university graduates, office workers and labourers. None of them have told their parents they smoke pot. They say their parents wouldn't understand. People in authority tended to watch it and probably were very alarmed at some of the things they saw because authority was being gradually challenged in Australia in the 1960s. Society was changing and uh, people tended to view some of these changes 
through programs like Four Corners, but especially Four Corners, because I guess we did do a few things from time to time that raised people's eyebrows and made them realise that things were changing. Saigon in April 1966 is an ugly city. It continues to live on the threshold of violence. At the end of almost any week here, you can run up a grim tally of incidents. This is where you can stand any day and see the muscles of war being paraded. This is the 17-mile four-lane highway that links Saigon with the big air base at Bien Hoa, where the Australian troops are living under canvas. Bien Hoa Air Base is a sprawling complex of military camps surrounding an airstrip. This is where you find Australia's main commitment to the war effort in Vietnam, the 1st Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment. Of the 1,300 Australians based at Bien Hoa, 26 have been killed in action and 141 wounded. They've killed 124 Viet Cong and captured more than 360. These are the Australian diggers of 1966. How do they feel about the war and the demonstrations at home against Australia playing a part in it? Well, uh, personally, I reckon they should be ashamed to call themselves Australians because, uh, well, <laughs> heck, once they take over Southeast Asia, what's next on their list? What do you say about these demonstrations when you get together at night and have a beer in the mess? <laughs> well, uh, some of it I couldn't say over the tape, but uh, I think that just about everybody agrees with me that uh, it's just not right. They should be ashamed of themselves for saying it. The men of the 5th Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment. They're marching to the sweaty jungles of far-off Vietnam. They leave behind them a nation united in prayers for their safety, but deeply split over the need for those prayers. Many of those marching are national servicemen, the first conscripted Australians to serve abroad in peacetime. Behind their going lie two generations of dispute over conscription, and a country more divided over a war than ever before in our history. They march in the shadow of Anzac Day, the sons of Second World War diggers and the grandsons of the men of Gallipoli. They go to fight in a country split by war and leave behind them a country split by conscience. This is the agony of Vietnam. I feel very proud that my son is marching today and the communists must be stopped in Vietnam. The thing I don't dis disagree with is sending the young lads to fight. I think this should be a professional soldier's war only. I have a son that is in the nat National Corps and he'll probably go in time and I'm a widow and he's my only son. And therefore I've got a face to say why shouldn't everyone else? It's a good experience. Makes a man out of them. No, they don't believe in conscription. If they want to go, they can go on their own accord. Do you like the idea of 20 year olds going overseas? 20, 18 and 19, yes, in they go. Before dispersal, a briefing session on the local hazards. Common sense and good judgment will keep you out of any problems with the local authorities. There are a few pet peeves of the local authorities that, that I must mention, and I'll run through them real quickly for you. Number one is narcotics. If you brought any pot, hemp, LSD, marijuana, any type of junk at all, and you managed to get it through customs, get rid of it before you leave the hotel. Uh, take it, smoke it, give yourself a shot, do whatever you do with it, just get rid of it. Do not leave the hotel with it. Take it outside, flush it down the commode, or come up and give it to me. Narcotics can net you a four-year imprisonment and a $10,000 fine. For indecent language, you may be fined up to $50. And something we never worry about, public drunkenness, uh, you may be fined up to $30. So if you're out in the middle of King's Cross somewhere, drunk and swearing your head off, bear in mind the fact that it may run you a total of 80 bucks. If you happen to spit while you're doing this, it may cost you 84 bucks. What's up, Mel? Oh, you know. No, can you tell me? A bloke that'll, uh, a girl that'll go with anyone, you know? Hey, but, are there many like that? Yeah, a few. But you're not. I don't think I am. I enjoy myself. I go with. Well, I come here, I'm not going with anyone at the moment, but I go home with a couple of blokes, different knives, but. I don't cast myself as a mole. This week, I talked with some boys who said they'd taken part in what they called gang bangs in the Bankstown district of Sydney. These boys are aged around 17 and 18. They were prepared to talk about what happened, they said, because they thought people should know what was going on. That story simply happened one week when we followed up 
a statement by a judge, if I remember correctly, along the lines of pack rape was becoming commonplace in the western suburbs of Sydney. We went out to one of the centres in western Sydney and uh, literally just talked to young people on the street. It was about eight, half past eight at night, and there was a, a producer with me, uh, and I just struck up conversations with kids and said, did you see what was in the paper and so on? Is there any truth in this? And as it happened, within about four or five conversations, we found a couple of uh, young people who were telling us that, yes, it does go on, but it's, it's not the way the judge described it. First, I asked them what they meant by the term gangbang. Oh, it's where a, a girl consents to a number of boys to have intercourse with her. And uh, they go somewhere where it's desolate and they can't be uh, obstructed in any way and they just carry out what they're going to do, that's all. How many boys does a girl have all together in one night sometimes? Oh, it could be any number, as many as she wants. How does one of these things get organised? Oh, there's probably a girl in the neighbourhood that's been around with a few boys and a couple of guys might line her up and they'll tell their friends and friends will tell their friends and then there it is. Do you think in those sort of situations rape can ever occur or will the girl always consent no matter how many boys are there? Well, I think rape can occur if, if there's too many or if there's someone she doesn't like. Something. Do you use contraceptives of any kind? No. Does the girl use them to your knowledge? No. How many pregnancies result from these sort of things? I would know. Some people found that very hard to be confronted with the results of those ideas in pictures in their living rooms. It was discomforting. You could turn it off, but they really turned away from watching it. I think Four Corners Aboriginal stories were amongst the most significant that it ever did. These Aboriginal stockmen are on strike. They walked off the job over a month ago. Their wives, children and relatives went with them. <coughs> this is the Wave Hill mob. Wave Hill is the territory's biggest cattle station, 5,186 square miles. In fact, the biggest in the world. The station's 100 Aboriginal stockmen, with their 100 dependents, are camped in the dry bed of the Victoria River, with little shade from 90 degree heat, dust and flies. Here in the vast outback, 600 miles south of Darwin, I listen to allegations of deprivation and inhumanity, of Aborigine claims that on some stations they live like dogs in huts they have to crawl into. Their food, salt, beef and damper. Aboriginal leader Dexter Daniels wants wage equality now, not, as the court said, by December 1968. Well, it's a long time. Wait. I think we, we shouldn't wait. We want the money now. You want the money now? Yes. About 1968. Too long to wait. So you want to break the law, in effect? That's right. You think you get all the Aborigines on your side? Yes. In all the Northern Territory? That's right. I will. I'll do all I can. Every way I can. I'll bring them. In my ways. The Frank Bennett story on the Gurindji people and Wave Hill uh, contributed to the public debate on Aboriginal affairs and I think were important in in turning the tide of, of public opinion for that 67 referendum. Australia's Aborigines, the first first settlers, the dark people. Nearly 200 years after the white man, a problem, a challenge, a disappointment, a guilty feeling. Next Saturday, 100,000 faces to be marked yes or no.